certain that the life, says the Lord, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. We brought nothing into this world and it is certain we shall carry nothing out. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Our Savior Christ Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of hell. Because I live, you will live also, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain. For the first things are passed away. Turn your attention to your order of service. The opening hymn, How Great Thou Art. After three, one, two, three. Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all thy words, thy hands have made, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power through all, thy union. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. And when I think. That God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take up. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art, when Christ shall come, with shouts of acclamation, to take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and pray me. My God, how great Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, 
God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Praise the Lord. God is a great God. Please be seated as we go to God in our opening prayers. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we turn to you in the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace. Let us go to God in prayer. We ask those who are in the back to be quiet. Most gracious God, we turn to you in the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace, so that even as we mourn the death of one whom we knew and loved, we may not be overcome by this trial, but we may hold fast, trusting in your goodness and mercy. Assure us, O oh Lord, our oh God, that death is not the end of those who trust in you. And may our hearts be so composed in the Holy Spirit that all fear and bitterness may be swallowed up in the light and peace you give to your troubled children. Through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, we pray. We say amen. We continue in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, who by the Holy Spirit Minister to us in our weakness. Minister now. And by the victory of your son, Jesus Christ, have given us the pledge of eternal life. Lift us, we pray, above our present distress and sorrow. And shed the light of your grace and glory upon us. Through the same Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. We all say amen. Amen. So we're met in a solemn moment to commend Lynette Verona Price into the hands of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer, by whose stripes we are healed and in whose name alone we have salvation. We're going to call to mind the life of our beloved sister. At this time, we'll be listening to tributes and the eulogy, after which we'll turn our attention to the Word of God. We invite at this time uh, the church choir, no? We'll invite um, a friend, right? Yes. A brother, okay. And after which we have a tribute from S. Campbell as well. Yes, please. story about it. Give me. Pleasant good afternoon to everyone. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now on occasion like this normally, we'll speak of the dash. That is the time of birth to the time of death. And in the case of Lynette, it was sunrise on the 8th of February, 1945, to the 4th of January, 2021. And in terms of bib biblical quotation, she would have lived more than three score and ten, she would, because she would have been 76 in the coming month. But on this occasion, I'll use... I'll use the analogy of transportation to pay tribute to Lynette. You know, in terms of transportation, you want to get from point A to point B or from one place to a particular destination. But there are several means of transport. And given the size of the family, I'll use the bus as the means of transport. 
When Lynette boarded the Price's family bus, there were four members on board, mother, father, a sister, and a brother. And when the bus was full, there were 16 members on board. And during the journey, there might have been temporary stops here and there for various purposes, whether work, pleasure, education, marriage, and the like. And then approximately, or well, just more than 24 years ago, mother departed permanently to the kingdom of the Almighty. Followed shortly thereafter by father, dada as we say, to the kingdom of the Almighty. And then just over a year ago, Brother Ferdinand also departed to the kingdom of the Almighty. But how do you remember Lynette? And I think what I'll have to say here today, family members will agree. Lynette was a, had a split personality. She wasn't bipolar, because that's a medical term, but she had a split personality. There was one Lynette, on the one hand, it was the loving, caring, sharing, sympathetic, helpful, kind-hearted, and sharing Lynette. And on the other hand, there was the Daliku, quarrelsome, unforgiven, and also the Lynette that will never trust you again. But when that was the occasion, it wasn't without cause. It's, it was because you might have done her something wrong, you would have hurt her or invaded her space. And as we're in the COVID-19, you would have entered a bubble uninvited. Uninvited. She was one of the most honest and authentic members of the family. And I say that without reservation. Because what you see was what you get. If she didn't like you, she'll, you will know it. Either by maintaining the distance from you quietly or by letting you know in certain ways. Despite that, she, had a very, she was very purposeful, focused, caring, and loving. And despite her lot in life, she was able to build a home for herself and raise a very, very wonderful son in Javel. Because it's not easy these days to raise children. Notwithstanding the fact that a certain level of discipline had to be maintained. Because as you know, in the Price's family, discipline was one of the watchword of the family. And therefore, Lynette, you have been called by the Almighty to enter into his kingdom. May you rest in peace until that day when all of us are called upon to account. The Lord will shine his face upon you. The Lord will preserve your soul until we meet again. Amen. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, family of God, family of our loved Lynette Verona Price, I stand before you on behalf of the Franklin Methodist Church, bringing deepest condolences to our member and family and our dear friend. Lynette Verona Price, Born on February 8, 1945, was the third of 14 siblings, eight boys and six girls, born to Conrad and Christiana Price. 
By her disposition, one can only assume that barring the era and family constraints that she existed in, Lynette was destined to be one of the world's most famous dramatists ever existed. But even if she was never featured in the world's Guinness Books of Records, she left in the hearts of many a legacy of fond memories that we can hold on to for as long as we live. Lynette was employed as a domestic worker for most of her life. Her employment status included a chef at Jacob's Guest House in Scarborough and a living maid for the family of ex-parliamentarian Arnold Pigott. She also worked for a few years on the URP program. Even as she did all this to make ends meet, Lynette found the time to move from house to house ironing for quite a few families throughout Tobago. What was most interesting about all this is the fact that families left their homes open for her to go in and do the ironing without fear that she might touch anything. Lynette walked with her own iron all the time, and she claimed nobody now said that me spoil the iron. A mother of one, Javon as she called him, Javon as we know him, Price, Lynette worked tirelessly to ensure that she gave him the best life she could at all cost. She saved hard and sacrificed all that she had to secure a piece of property and a home for them. And as encouraged by Miss Agnes on the first day of every month, Lynette and Miss Agnes will go to Scarborough to ensure that she updated her bank book. But that did not go without some drama because Lynette went into the bank and asked, if me get X dollars in the bank and me put in Y, then me supposed to have X plus Y. So the teller explained that they are bank taxes and therefore she would not see the exact amount. I do not have to tell you the rest. But Lynette, the manager came out because the teller did not want to let her see him. After Lynette fun words, the manager came out and Lynette left the bank with her bank book recording X plus Y. <laughs> when Lynette got tired of ironing and gave up the job completely due to pains in her wrist, she claimed that she has to save her energy to starch an iron handkerchief to decorate his back pocket to attract the ladies. Well, one fish got caught by Lynette's well-designed saying. And so, Rene Campbell Price swam all the way from Wim to Lekito, right into Lynette's yard to marry her son. The union bought two gems of Lynette's life, Janet and Javier. For her, they did no wrong. And although she was an extremely strict disciplinarian to Javon, she was totally upset whenever they disciplined their own children and would fly downstairs to find out why they have to burn the boy's skin all the time. So, for their birth, so, sorry, from their birth to her passing, she would offer them large sums of money for their birthdays, Christmas, and for the beginning of every new school term. A synopsis of Lynette's life cannot be complete without sharing some of the fun moments of the life of our dearest, and as she was called, Cusbud cousin. LP was one of the most contented human being I have ever met. If cricks and water was all she had on Christmas Day, that is what she would have without a fuss or bother or begging. And she grew up her son knowing that he must always be contented with what she could have afforded him. So when she struggled to purchase his school supplies and he came home without his pencil for three straight days, and on the fourth day she promised him a fine licking, and he still came home without it. 
he tried his best to save himself of such licking by telling her that a boy in his class stole his pencil and by accident called a boy named Prince in his class at random. <laughs> what Javon did not know, that Lynette would find herself at the school gate the next day and gave poor Prince a fine tongue flashing for stealing her son's pencil. And when she could not afford a barber and trimmed him herself, and the boys tapped him and laughed at his haircut, the mistake Javon made yet again was to tell his mother, well, oh well. The next day, Lynette walked from Lekito to Golden Lane and waited at the game again. And I end by saying, mission accomplished. <laughs> and after a few more of such episodes, Javern learned the hard way that he must not tell his mother when he was bullied by anyone. What was touching, though, for me is that when in secondary school and during a basketball game, Javon attempted a dunk and missed the ring, dunking the ball on a teacher's calf. Even when the other parents claimed that their son did not do the damage, Lynette sent whatever she could have afforded every fortnight to the teacher until eventually the teacher stopped taking the monies. This act confirms her desire to do the right even in adverse situations. She gave from her heart even when she had to do without. Ask her for a hand of green fig from her garden and she will send you a bunch. She gave freely without second thought. But one needed to understand the difference between giving and lending or borrowing. So when a couple persons ask her to borrow money and she gladly loan them and the payback they come without completing the deal, she would find herself at your house and of course the rest is history. My cousin's strong will, bravery and determination saw her through many unfair actions. After struggling to provide a home for herself and her son, she attempted to stop the neighborhood from making her yard a thoroughfare for pedestrians. And for this, her house was torn at night. Rotten eggs and other objects were placed in the yard to scare her. And the list goes on and on. But that did not deter her because she believed in her God and she prayed and prayed and her Bible was her best friends, and her psalm, she said, morning, noon, and night. So when Lynette denounced every trick of the devil that they had put there to scare her, she had nothing to fear about. So brave was Lynette that one day she peeped through her window, and she had a window with the board louvers that couldn't close. So Lynette peeped through her window and recognized that she saw the neighbor who claimed to be a quote-unquote magician giving baths to individuals. And Lynette was caught by the woman. So when the woman saw Lynette, the woman shouted, Oh God, I can't do me walk in peace. That was the mistake she made. So Lynette flew out from the window peeping flew out in her yard and declare, well, me now peep again. I make for watch. So me, I come outside and me, I watch. You do what you have to do. <laughs> and as if that wasn't enough, Lynette told the woman, the lotto is $5 million this week. No winner. And you're going to see for me and you. <laughs> well, it turned out that the magician had to be the one peeping to see when Lynette was home <laughs> as she assumed a self-inflicted curfew and could not access her own property once Lynette was around.
Lynette, I must admit, had a very hard life. By, but by her determination to raise her son in the fear and love of God, paid off big time in the end. Javern ensured that his mother was always taken care of in the best way possible. In fact, it was custom for her to awake at 5 a.m. every morning or earlier for quite a while, since she claimed that her body hate, hurts if she stayed down longer. The very first salary that Javon earned, he bought his mother a new mattress. The next morning, Lynette awoke at 7 a.m. and only then confessed that the previous mattress was too thin and extremely comfortable, and that's why she had to wake up so early. For Lynette, J. Vaughan, as she called him, was so old. And for him, his mother was his tower of strength. Lynette knew that challenging, channeling her finance towards the education of her son and his family took precedence over everything else. To Javern, her only child, Rene, her daughter-in-law, Janae and Javier, her two only grandchildren, her ten siblings, her family members and friends, I stand here today representing a life that was lived the way only Lynette knew how, the way that God destined it to be, the way we are meant to accept and understand because it is God's will to take her home to a place that he has prepared for her. As we grieve, let us remember the words of the psalmist David in chapter 34, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. We will surely miss you, Lynette. We will always love you. Sleep on mommy. Sleep on granny. Sleep on mother-in-law, cousin, friend. Take your well-deserved rest. Sleep in eternal peace. Good. My mother would greet every morning. As Moy say, when she wake up early, she wake up usually at 4 o'clock. And she read the psalm as she would open her back door and read it at 6. Every morning. who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with, the, with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His, faithless, his faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that fires by day, or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or the destruction that waits at, at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see punishment of the wicked. Because you have the Lord, your refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. No, scour no scourge come near, come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the other, the young lion and the serpent you will trample on the foot. Those who love, who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. 
When they came and called me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. The word of the Lord. The next reading will be done. is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with also give us mercy? Who will bring any, who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who it is, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to our readers and Reverend. Yeah, you did well. <laughs> we have a slight change in the order. The offering is to, will be taken at this point. We'll be singing the hymn. Um, to the tune of the happy wanderer with the refrain, he lives, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. We'll remain seated and we'll sing the hymn for the offering. Uh, we'll need as many baskets as possible to to Okay. Yeah. After two, one, two. Of my shepherd I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me. The quiet waters by. He lives, he lives, he lives. I know that my Redeemer lives, he lives, he lives, he lives within my heart. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness, him for his own name's sake. Come on, church, say he lives, he lives, he lives. I know that my Redeemer lives, he lives, he lives, he lives within my Yedo, Yedo, I walk in death's that way, yet will I fare no ill. For thou art with me on thy rock, and calf me comfort still. Oh, he lives, he lives, oh, he lives. I know that my Redeemer lives, he lives, he lives, he lives within my heart. Goodness and mercy are. 
My dwelling place, say he lives, he lives, he lives. I know that my some person on the outside. He lives, he lives within. Sing, sing, sing. He lives, he lives, he lives. We invite you to stand. I know that my Redeemer lives, he lives, so he lives, he lives within my heart. Let us pray. Most loving God, we offer to you now these gifts of monies. We know that our best gift is our very selves. So even now as we dedicate it to your work, we pray that you will take us and use us to the glory of your name. Through Christ we pray. All say amen. Thank you, my brothers. Please be seated. I want to spend a few minutes reflecting on Romans chapter 8 and the portion read for us from verse 31 to 39. Paul, at this point in his letter to the church in Rome, began to put forward what are some of the implications of knowing Christ. So often we view persons from the outlook of what we think they should do and what they, we think they should know. And we forget the part that God knows and what God does. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, even now then, we commit our hearts and our minds to you. It is my prayer that this word of comfort will lift us and strengthen us. And in particular, the family members and those who are really close to our beloved Lynette will experience your grace in this time. Through Christ we pray. From which place should we construct any kind of God talk? From what place should we begin to talk about the state of humanity in the world as it exists today? There's one thing we can agree on. is the growing face of evil in the world. How depravity and separation shows itself in so many ways in which we live. If you should make a list of all the wrongs and evils that are in the world, you would not stop. Every single one of us in here will be able to name something without repeating ourselves. So why is this so? And why is it so hard that after all these years of the good news being preached and shared in so many different ways and on so many fronts, Hearts of people continue to abide with evil. Of course, for someone to take on the task of going to all humanity and sharing this news, it had to be that something bigger than them, something much larger in their spirit, would have, as it were, shoved them in the back. I can't see anybody in their right minds deciding that they will just simply go to the world and tell the world, you're living in sin and you need to know that God loves you very much. I guess, as a matter of fact, I can remember growing up with my siblings back there in Montego Bay in Jamaica. And so often there were things coming up in the church. And I would just feel a little shove in my back. 
Every time you'd hear, anybody who wants to do this with, and then but there I was standing forward. But it was somebody who pushed me. Here it is that we have one of the greatest persons to have preached the gospel, Paul, sharing his own outlook on how the world has turned and what is its solution. Paul is steaming with hate and anger as he is going to Damascus to get rid of the Christians, the people of the way, who have been, you know, purporting, sharing, um, talking about this Jesus Christ. No indications that Paul met Jesus ever. But what was real was that something was happening in the lives of people who were living in the context of restrictions. The Jews were under the oppression of the Romans at the time. They weren't free to just simply do anything that they wanted. But here was Jesus Christ moving out, moving around so freely. With such power and authority. Calling people to himself. People were so attracted to this great move. This revival of what God was doing in the earth. And even though there were disagreements as to who he really is. Something was happening to the people who put their trust in him. Something took place in the heart of those who opened up their minds to him. Lowly fishermen. Rich, thieving, corrupt tax collectors turned from their ways and followed him with Christ. It was against this move Paul pushed. And when he thought he would have actually succeeded in bringing down this band of upstarts who were now causing trouble in the religious realm of the Jews, <laughs> there he met Jesus on the road. To Damascus. Paul's missionary journeys are well documented. He would have traveled from place to place in what was considered the known world at the time. Some of the things that were happening in Paul's day, <laughs> technology was actually up. So many things were already invented. And by this time, the the entire Old Testament was in circulation. Written over by those persons who sat down every living day and just write, write. The Old Testament was spread throughout the known world. People were actually reading the Bible. They didn't really understand some of it, but Paul was able to take this very Old Testament. And he was now able to declare that in this very word is the very Son of God himself, who promised he would come, who promised that he would turn the evils around, who promised that he would make a way in the sinful world. So, if you read Romans 8, as a matter of fact, if you read the book of Romans and you don't have any Bible at all, but you read Romans, and if you don't have any Bible at all and you can read Romans chapter 8, I can guarantee you, you will get such insight into the life of what it really means to be born again. So, what was Paul's argument? He said there's one reality that we all have to live with. Amidst the sin and all the pains of this life, there is one thing that for sure we will have to experience, and it's death. I don't know if anyone here has lost a loved one, but for a long while, the only loved one I lost was my great-grandmother. And then afterwards, I lost a grandmother on my father's side. I can tell you, loss is very devastating. It's heartbreaking. Sometime afterwards, I lost my grandfather on my father's side, and I never lost a loved one for a long while. People in my family tend to live long. My grandmother died at 106 years old. So when she died, wow. Saw Javern staring at his mother. Saw him. I've not seen anybody stare at her dead 
so long for a long while in my life. But can that wear off? <laughs> can it wear off? <laughs> no. And yet still, what seems to strike at the heart of our existence in this world is that we seem to just get over this very thing called death while we are all standing on our own graves or sitting on them. Because it only takes a little while from now when it will open up and receive us our very selves. And yet, in all of this life, with 2020 gone, with so many persons dying from a virus, we seem to have gotten so numb to the fact that this big thing called sin, which causes us to behave all sorts of terrible ways, results in something called death. As real as any evil that you and I do. As real as that. With all the selfishness that is perpetuated by us against each other. The wickedness that we do to our neighbors, moving their boundary lines and all these things. The wickedness with which we live our lives. Death is as real. Somehow though, when you, when you read the Bible, you, you just get the sense that death could not have been the last. Hallelujah. That is God who created the heavens and the earth. Who made everything so beautiful until we all messed it up. Certainly could not have made it for us to just simply be born, live and die. It's totally against his nature. It's totally against his characteristics and his qualities. It's totally against who God really is. And if you really would stop and give God a chance with your little mind, because somehow we continue to think that we are, well, our thoughts are bigger than God. We think that we can think out God and think God away. Wake up. God is bigger than you think. I know. Some people hate God because of terrible things that have happened to, to them or a loved one. And Javern has to be careful. He might start questioning God to the point where he doesn't get the answers that he wants. He might say, you know what? This loving God, so-called, isn't worth believing anymore. Oh, yes. A lot of persons have been flung to the other extreme because something happened in their lives that they claim God didn't have an answer for. <laughs> If you would just want to compare for me an example that I, a very well noted apologist would put forward. In the care that an animal will give to, you know, the, the kid or the cub or so on. And you would look at how strong that animal mother would be in nurturing that young one. It gets to the point when they have to be weaned, <laughs> I don't care how that little one wants another suck. She would kick it away, hit it away, because she knows that it has to get tough to live in this wicked world. Where crossing a road could just mean a mean driver decided to speed up or didn't stop and hit that animal out of the road, run over it. By the way, let me see the hand here of anybody who would never kill an animal on the road. Eh? <laughs> oh, wow. Accidents do happen, yes. But there are times when, trust me, some people just say, just kill a dog, yeah. And press out. Wah! I don't know if you don't call that wickedness. And then compare that animal with a human being. That animal will know that that that, that young one has to learn to live in this world. And yet, a human being, a mother, a, a father, would spoil their child. Would find it hard to allow that child to learn from the tough times and the challenges of life. This noted apologist was giving this story of his daughter. who was in the brownies trying to 
string the needle and she was there having a hard time. And he thought about helping her. And he said, no, you know, if I help her, then she's probably going to run, come to me all the time. And when she really needs to learn to, to thread the needle for herself, she won't be able to do it at all. So he stood there behind and watched as she did the impossible. Of course, she ran to him and said, hey, dad, look what I did. I, look what I did. I strung the needle. I strung the needle. And he thought, wow. There's another story that I read so many years ago. In a d d devotion I love very much called Streams in the Desert. There was this moth man was watching this moth coming out of its cocoon and it was struggling and it was struggling and it was struggling, struggling. And he thought he would help it. And he snipped right there at this trumpet um, moth. And he snipped the thing so that it would come out with greater ease. And no sooner than it came out, in a few minutes, it and died. He intervened in what was the process. He intervened in what was the way for it to get all its strength in its wings. So while we could do without sin, while we could do without all the other things, and we think that, oh, this great God should really be intervening in our lives the way we think he should, let me tell you this. That there's something greater at stake. It's not about having a nice roof over our heads or nice clothes to wear. It's about your soul. And you will not learn how valuable it is until trouble lick you. 2020 was a year for God to get all of us attention. That there's something more going on here. And if you have not yet waken up to the fact that death tears us in the face and will take us out anytime, you must make sure you put an insurance in place. And that is your faith. In the only person and the only name by which we can be saved. Jesus Christ. And it's so funny though. With all the evidence that's there. Of how God changes our lives through Christ. That people still think there are other ways. Or other persons. Or other names. Or other lifestyles. There is no other. There is none other that is as selfless. None other. That is so sacrificial. None other that gives meaning to life. As the life of Jesus Christ. A life that Lynette owned. And lived so it's a fascinating thing for me. <laughs> when Paul wrote this letter, he's showing the world that Jesus Christ is God's son. He's eloquent about it. And if you read such passages, Genesis 1, John's Gospel chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, 15, verse 15 through to 21. If you read Hebrews 1, I could know, go on. Psalm 8, Ephesians 2, you could read them all. And it's clear that Jesus is God himself who has come to earth. The word that spoke everything into being. Let there be, let there be. Who then spoke to himself. Let us make humankind in our image and likeness. Is the one who came to earth. Paul is convinced about this. He was an intellect. He was a man of rational mind. And he came to the place. Why? Because when it comes to Christ, it comes down to one thing. It's called revelation. And on Damascus Road, when he met Christ, he says, he says, who are you, Lord? Where did he know Jesus from? <laughs> who are you, Lord? And this was so convincing for Paul that he went throughout the world Sharing this good news of Jesus Christ. He's making his case, right? Um, he's making his case. And it, it's, it's a case that you and I can't overlook. There is sin. There is death. But there's also life. Life eternal. I like the analogy of the, of the brother. Talked about 
what point she entered into the bus. <laughs> and when she entered into life at that time, she entered into eternity. She couldn't tell what had gone on before. She wasn't there. She never lived to see it. But she would have lived with the others and saw all the other things that transpired then. But guess what? When she died, that wasn't the end of her. This is not the end of her. <laughs> oh, no. The, you see, when we accept Jesus Christ, the new birth takes place. The new birth happens. We are spiritually alive. If anyone in Christ is a new creation, the old is passed away. Behold, all things new have come. Paul is convinced about this. And so what he did as he gets to this part, I wrap this message up, is that he was saying, when you think about it, the Christian has the same problems like everybody else in the world. The difference is that we just treat with it differently. We only need to treat with hers. Read our Bible and pray. <laughs> when I heard him say how authentic she was, yet some of the things he would say would be probably disturbing. And people would be quick to say, oh, come she a Christian and she a go answer. She has somebody like you and me. <laughs> she has a human being like you and me. And the wonderful thing about our Savior is this. He knows that there comes a point when we grow up and we mature in him. But when we fall and fail, it's no reason for you to look at me or somebody else and say, see it there? They're my hypocrite. No one bother with this thing. Yeah, you're making a mistake. Because I would love to invite you and say to, all right, come do better, no? <laughs> come do better. Yeah, man, come do better. Come do better. <laughs> and you realize that when you try to live this life in your own strength, you will fail. It's why this part of the scriptures is so exciting for me. And obviously demonstrated in Lynette's life. Because if God is for us, hallelujah, if God is for us, Answer me. Answer me now. Oh, yeah, man. If God is for us, who? And that's why some of us are losing our way because we want to fight our own battles. We're making deals with the devil. And when the devil decides to start lash you, you can't manage your own come at church. Beg for prayer. You think that's how it go? You should be able to cover your own life. You're responsible for your own soul. In Jesus Christ, you can't call upon the blood of Jesus over your own life. Get real. You think this is no superstition we're promoting? You think we're just promoting religion? Now see, I'm a, no worry about how I dress up. There's a reason for it, whatever. But let me tell you something when it comes down to the nitty gritty. It's between me and Amanda. And him see it the same way. He sees it the same way. So you can't guard up. The day is going to come when you're going to die. Nothing could stop it. Look at Trump. When we boast and elevate ourselves, we're setting up ourselves for a huge fall. Yes, this is what this whole life in Jesus Christ is about. I'm now in him. I'm covered on every side through him. And he expects me to grow up in him. He expects me to get to the place where I can look like him in one thing, in love. Yes. I may fail in so many other ways, but at the end of the day, you should be able to still say of me that I loved. Can't we conclude that about Lynette? Can't we conclude that about Oh, hallelujah. That is a product of our love. So yes, Paul is saying, when sin took place, we fell. The whole creation fell. Verse 22, chapter 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. 
It says not only the creation, be what we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Oh yes, we'll be changed. Transformation. We'll be caught up. Transportation. For in hope we are saved. The hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But we hope for what we do not see. We wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the very Spirit intercedes with sighs. It's too deep for words. And God searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What I'm trying to get you to understand here is that Lynette has lived a victorious life. And the victory is now sealed in our sleep. In our death. As if you believe in Christ, even though you die, yet shall you live. He who believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So yes, Paul wraps it up. When you think about all the things that are going on in this world, the truth is nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It is God's love that you have, my brother. It is God's love that we have. And even though you have lost your mother, that love can never be lost. That love can never be taken away. And even though you may get naked as some people have through COVID-19 and still are, people have lost their homes and lost their jobs. People can't feed them picnic right now. I can tell you this. The love cannot be lost. You may be saying, God, why are you putting me through this? And God says, you need me more than food and water. Clothes and housing. So yes, Paul answered the question. Will hardship, will distress, it's a rhetoric. It's rhetorical. Persecution or famine, nakedness, peril, sword. No, 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 no. Nothing. Nothing. I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So if you're staring death in the face this afternoon, in a literal sense, we are because we're staring at this coffin right now. <laughs> we're gathered here because of death. But there's something that transcends that. It's called God's love in Jesus Christ. And those of you who are here, who have hardened your hearts week after week, month after month, year after year, against God, Fighting all kind of excuses and fault with the church. I'm saying to you this afternoon. Do not continue to scoff at God's love. Just know that it's because he loves you. Why you breathe right now. And why you're alive. You should consider cutting out your selfishness and opening your heart and receive him. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we reaffirm, reaffirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Some people don't like to use the word Catholic. It's a common C, which means universal. So if you're more comfortable with saying that, you can. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended to the dead, and the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Amen. Praise be to you, O God, our Father, who created us in your own image for eternal fellowship with you. Praise and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, O Lord and our God, who have overcome the sharpness of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. And now seated at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. Praise and blessing be to you, O Holy Spirit, God, our comforter, who bear witness within us of our acceptance with the Father, and have become our pledge of eternal inheritance. All praise and glory, blessing and honor, thanksgiving and worship be to you, O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We bless your name for the life of her whom we today lay to rest. We give you thanks for the joy and blessing her life has brought to others for her service to her generation according to your will and for every happy remembrance of Lynette's life. We bless you for your mercy and goodness which have followed Lynette all the days of her life, that now the trials of this world are over and death itself is past. Receive her into your perfect kingdom and bring us with all who have lived and served you faithfully to the fullness of your eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, we pray. Amen. We invite the family to stand as we pray for the family at this time. Immediate family, close. O oh Lord God, by whom every family on this name is earth, on earth is named, we commend to you, Lord, this Price family and all their connections. We come to you for strength and grace. And even as they continue to mourn, Lord God, grief will not overcome them. We pray that they will grow in closeness, in oneness, in love and support. We pray for every provision that they need. But most of all, Lord, even now we pray that they will all open their hearts and know the comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit. We commend them to you. And ask, Lord, that you will guard them and protect them in all their ways. That you will never just let them know now that you have them. And that you will never, ever let them go. Loving God, we pray that for those who will have extreme points of grief, Lord, that we will always be understanding about the way they will grieve. Help us to help each other. And help us, Lord, to continue to lend support to this family at this time. Through Christ we pray. Amen. We invite everyone to stand with the family at this time as we will be commending the body. I want to, on behalf of the entire congregation and this church leadership, offer condolences to Christ's family. Of course, as a, <laughs> well, you would know, but they know that it's only the 1st of January I picked up. <laughs> pastoring them. Yesterday was my first service here. And today, Monday is my second service here. <laughs> so I've only just gotten to know Javern in the past few days through the Zoom support and family meetings to plan the service. I've already pledged my support to you and your family. And you can depend on me. Let us commend the body. Almighty God, who have made us all and hate nothing that you have made, we commend Lynette Verona into your perfect hands of love and mercy. Through Christ we pray. Amen. 
eternal rest grant unto her, and your response is, and let perpetual light, and let perpetual light shine upon her. The Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, boss. Please remember to remain where you are. As the quiet, quiet, please. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> As the Father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes and the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children. Father pities those so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Paul Bearers, we invite you to Come now and assist. Family members, we invite you to come and. Yes, bearers, we want you to come and help us to lift at this time. Yeah, bearers, Paul, bearers, as many as possible. We're going straight to the. We're going straight to the grave. As the Father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. Watch his steps. Watch his steps. Yes. As for man, his days are as grass as the flower of the field, so he flourishes. The wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon those who fear him. And his righteousness to his children's children. 